my dears, we're gonna start with the image description for my blind and low vision friends. I am a white person with not shoulder length, like a little longer than shoulder length, I guess. Dirty blonde curly hair. I'm wearing a light green undershirt and a white button up shirt that has little teal blue flowers on it. Um, and I'm sitting in front of some books and some photos behind me on the wall, per usual for the most recent section of time. Today we are going to talk about that thing that your psychology professors tell you about the clear differences between girl and boy brains um, and how those are not a thing really at all and there's actually a lot of research to prove that. And before I have angry people who are new to my channel and they just saw something about me saying gender doesn't exist and then they comment like, what do you know about all this? You're just a kid. Hi, my name is Sydney. I use they them pronouns because I am gender fluid, aka trans, and I know a lot about gender because I have all of them. Um, I have been reading research papers since I was 10 years old and I study psychology, neuroscience, and education, and I accidentally sort of kind of have written what, what I've been told would qualify for at least three master's theses. Um, according to some professors, I don't really want a master's because I don't want to work in psychology and I hate school. Um, but yeah, also I do read an average of 10 to 15 research papers per video I make and I usually remember to link them in the description. So I'm not just some random kid here to rant about gender to you. I am a very specific adult to rant about gender with scientific basis. So thank you for being kind and willing to listen to what I have to say. I truly appreciate it. it, means a whole lot. Also, this video is not like, hey transphobes, here's science to prove that you're wrong. If you're set in your ways as a transphobe, you're not gonna listen to science anyway. I know that. This is a, hey, the thing your biology and psychology professors who learned about sex differences when they were in college 20 or 30 years ago, that has always made you feel a little weird about yourself because you're not quite sure if it's accurate or not, is in fact very wrong, so here I did all of the research for you. Um, this is also great for that brand of person who's totally cool with trans people um, and is totally upset about all the anti-trans bills, but they also believe that being trans is an outlier and that we shouldn't do sports because it's unfair. Um, and they're great with pronouns b for binary trans people, but then when there's anything out of the binary, it kind of throws them for a loop. You know at least several people like that. I think we all do. Um, you're welcome to send this video to transphobes as well if you so desire, um, but if it doesn't change their mind, don't be too upset about it. This isn't geared towards you, transphobes. Anyway, let's talk about gender, sex, and the brain. And I think the first thing we should do is do a basic rundown of what sex and gender are before we start to get really complicated, just to make sure that everybody has the same basis knowledge to work off of. And for this, we're going to need our friend, the genderbred person. If you have not come across the genderbred person before, I highly, highly recommend it as a tool for teaching about gender and sexuality. It's what I and a lot of my friends have used to explain our gender identities to parents and grandparents. Um, also works just as well with little kids and it's awesome. Um, I will link it in the description for you if you wanna check it out. So looking at our genderbred friend here, you will see uh, four different spectrums. And the first one is gender identity, then we have gender expression, biological sex, and sexual orientation. Obviously, this is going to be kind of simplified. Being genderqueer is not necessarily being in the middle of man or woman. There are parabinaries, which are outside of the binary rather than non-binary, kind of like too much gender rather than no gender. That was a bad description. Also, there are sexual orientations that aren't on here, um, but as a basis of thing to work off of, this is perfect. So the first spectrum is gender identity, and that's the brain here, um, and it's how you think about yourself. It does not mean how your brain is formed or anything like that. This thing specifically does say it's the chemistry that composes you, aka hormonal levels. We will talk shortly about how hormones kind of have absolutely nothing to do with gender and how you think about your own gender. That's later on in the video, um, but just ignore that. This is instead how you think about yourself and how you perceive your own gender. So for example, growing up, I always thought of myself as a girl or a woman, and then recently I did some more thinking and I realized that actually sometimes I'm non-binary mask and sometimes I'm parabinary and sometimes I'm just a girl and sometimes I'm just androgynous non-binary, and that's why I identify as gender fluid because my gender changes a lot. And the way that I figured that out was through the second spectrum, and that one is gender expression, and that refers kind of to the entire body of our genderbred friend. Um, gender expression is how you outwardly demonstrate your gender, typically based on traditional gender roles because they're a little inescapable, so that's how you dress, how you wear your hair, etc. So when I was like, hmm, Am I more than one gender? I played around with different forms of gender expression. I tried on traditionally masculine clothing and I felt more me. I tried on traditionally really feminine clothing. I also felt more me. And then I combined the two into an androgynous or like the opposite of androgynous, like 
all of the gender rather than no gender, I also felt more me. And some days I couldn't recognize myself and felt really gross in masculine clothing. Um, and then sometimes I felt the same way about wearing fem femme clothing. And sometimes a combo made me feel really gross. And other days the same exact outfits would make me feel absolutely incredible and amazing. Which let me know that one, my gender changes a lot for me. And two, <laughs> it's not just within the traditionally femme category, but also gender isn't real. We'll get into that in a little bit. Next is biological sex. That is, according to this, your reproductive organs, your hormones, your chromosomes, etc. Um, you can be biologically male, female, or any of the none of the above, none of the above categories. Typically that's called intersex. Um, we're gonna talk about how this is also not really a thing in a bit, but traditionally <laughs> you have your biological sex versus your gender identity versus your gender expression and all of those things don't have to match up at all whatsoever. And that is totally normal and totally fine. In fact, it is delightful and lovely. Let's all just subvert every cultural norm. Yay. Now, anyway, so the last one here is sexual orientation. That is your heart in reference to who you're attracted to, which has never made sense to me because attraction is also very much from your brain and not your heart. Your heart does the blood bit. That made me sound really autistic. We're not talking about that today, but that's also a thing that I want to mention. Anyway, that also does not need to line up with any of the above spectrums, though I don't know how it would line up anyway. Gender-bred person. Yep, yeah, there you go. Uh, that's our basis. Also, important to mention that any and all of the things on here can and will shift and change over time. These are not set. You may have identified as gay and then as bisexual later in life. Your biological sex may change when you get bottom surgery and start hormones. Your gender expression can change several times a day if it so desires. Your gender identity will also change and grow over time and all of that is completely normal. And not just like, oh, you went from cis to trans way, but like in a holistic, people grow and change and understand themselves differently over time as they learn to inhabit their own bodies kind of way, if that makes any sense. So now that we have that basis, let's destroy it. Um, this is gonna be kind of like that thing when you first learn a math skill and then your teacher tells you there's like a very specific rule you have to follow in order to do that math skill. And then like two years later, you're in your next math class and your teacher just goes, everything you ever learned in these grades before is completely wrong and we're completely starting over and you get really, really mad about it, but you don't actually stop to think about how the original half truth that you were given created the groundwork for you to be able to later on throw it out the window and learn new things. I don't know if that analogy made sense, but I tried. Moving on. So biologically, what is sex? Not like copulation and mating. Um, I r really don't care about that unless, unless it's about great white sharks because nobody really knows how they mate because only one or two people have ever seen it before. And it's never been caught on camera and science just has a, a whole lot of questions about great white shark sex, but we're not talking about sharks right now. This video is interesting. Anyway, sex. So in a biological sense, this is not simply the chromosomal definition you got in your AP bio class or the simple genital or reproductive or hormonal or genetic difference either. It's way more confusing and all over the place than that. Now, the first thing to know is that the idea of sex only exists essentially because of reproduction. If you use your DNA to make babies one way, you're a male. If you use your DNA to make babies another way, you are a female. And traditionally, males have the small gamete, gametes and the females have the large gametes. That's how we decide in biology. But also, there are many species where the sex of an animal changes based on environmental factors or aging. Um, I listened to a podcast that I will link in the description for you. This is the second part of the podcast. Um, and it talked about grouper, which is a really massive fish, and they change sex like four times in their life based on their size and age. Really wacky. Also, it talked about a type of worm, I think it was, that like when it's a baby, it's a male and it makes male gametes and then it stores them. And then once it becomes older, um, it becomes a female. And if they don't ever find a mate, it'll just fertilize itself with the male gametes and then reproduce with itself, which is effectively asexual reproduction, but also not. There's also species that don't have any pure males or females. Um, and obviously asexual reproduction also exists. Um, the reason that we have two biological sexes, the male and the female, is because the majority of species need one of each part in order to reproduce. That is the only reason. And if you're like, well, why do most species need two to reproduce? Let's think about this one evolutionarily here. If you asexually reproduce, AKA the entire population becomes a clone of you. If one disease appeared that knocked you out, absolutely every other clone is gonna die too. Goodbye population, you're extinct. Um, and if you needed three of your species in order to be compatible and make a baby, 
that would get really complicated really quickly. And so if that ever happened evolutionarily, which probably did because biodiversity is funky, they probably had a much harder time making said babies and therefore didn't last very long as a species. Also, in addition to many species just changing sex as they so desire, there are also many species without sex chromosomes or genetic sex markers at all. For example, a lot of reptiles, while they're born with a specifically determined sex, when the eggs are laid, they're all genderless. They all have the same genetic code. It's the temperature of the environment that the eggs are laid in that determines what sex they will be born as, which is also really funky. So moral of the story here, sex as an idea only exists for reproduction, not for, you know, the rest of life. And that regardless of what definition you use for this biological phenomenon, whether that's with genes or chromosomes or genitalia, secondary sex characteristics, hormones, reproductive cells, etc, etc. Every single one of those things inevitably has an exception in some species somewhere because biodiversity is really quite fun. Now, what biologically is gender, you may ask? Well, first of all, it's, it's not. Gender is not a biological thing. It's a purely social dynamic. We created it just like we created race and religion and the days of the week. And when it comes down to it, Gender's really abstract and it doesn't really need to be there. And you may be thinking, but don't animals have different roles and behaviors based on their sex? Yeah, kind of. Males and females of any species do behave in different ways systematically um, across the species. But first of all, that is not the rule in nature. It's kind of common, but it's not the rule. And second of all, as we talked about in my solitary forager hypothesis video, genuine examples of animal culture that can be observed with an outside eye, I have opinions on that, We'll get there in a hot second. Genuine examples of animal culture are relatively rare. The majority of species are not inherently social or cultural with each other. And the ones that we see that are, they don't involve sex specific patterns of behavior and learning the way that human gender works. Like, sure, the females of a species may all do the same kind of behaviors, but you're not going to specifically see females teaching other females how to female, if that makes any sense. Anthropologically, scientists believe that gender norms based off of sex roles, which we do kind of see in nature, um, those were created in human populations when we began to create small communities, albeit nomadic ones that were still moving around, and it was an easy way to divide up labor based on skills. For example, in many cultures, it is the norm that men who are typically males do jobs that require a lot of upper body strength because human males typically have more upper body strength than females do. I'm not saying females can't have a lot of upper body strength, um, but I would assume it has something to do with the higher fat content in relation to muscle that females have to have in order to support a baby. Not sure, that also does not have to be the rule, just a common pattern. Um, and by dividing up labor easily this way, both groups were statistically more likely to do a good job at their assigned duty, and then the community was more likely to survive and reproduce, therefore evolutionarily making us go, oh, we have sex roles and gender norms. Um, but also in many societies before colonization and imperialism, genders other than traditional man and woman were very, very commonplace for our species as well. So not cis people are very much not by any means new. But basically, gender roles emerged in human populations as a result of cultural evolution for survival reasons and have been passed down to new generations through cultural learning. Less for survival reasons now, it's just kind of what we do. And while biological difference has on some level a part in that, and therefore you can't really separate sex from gender, like they're inseparable, they don't need to be connected. Think of it this way. Early societies probably went, hey, all of you really buff people who can lift a lot of heavy things and throw a spear really far, you should go hunt and everybody else is gonna stay here and gather berries and such. And statistically, the ones with more upper body strength would be the males. So at some point, people probably started going, huh, we're noticing that the majority of the ones going to hunt also happen to have the same genitalia, so we're gonna start raising them from when they're little to learn those skills so that they can be even better and more efficient when they're adults so that we can get more food to survive longer. And well, the rest is history. Now, the one thing that I do have to say about this whole argument that I struggle with is I struggle with the idea that humans are something special. Maybe I'm both very Quaker and autistic, but I see our species as equal to any other species. And it really bothers me that we've claimed the entire planet and think that we're better than every other species. So the article that I read about animals and gender specifically said, when we see different behaviors in men and women, we cannot infer as we can with animals that these behaviors emerge from innate biological differences. And on one level, from a gender and sex animal behavior scientific perspective, yeah, sure totally checks out. 
but also we have no way of knowing if every other species does not have their own form of social gender differentiation and gender-based training of their young because when we observe animal culture we are no matter what on some level looking at it through a vaguely human lens so we don't know if a female whale taught another female whale that she needs to act a certain way to fit in because we're not whales so Yes, the quote of when little boys reject dolls, we don't learn about their innate abilities to care for infants. Instead, we have to see this sort of behavior in humans through an entirely different lens does check out. But also based on everything I know about biodiversity, we're probably not the only species with gender or sex normativity. That seems pretty statistically improbable and a little arrogant to assume. But anyway, so the moral of this story here is that you cannot pull gender and sex apart from each other because Biology does not exist in isolation from society, and society does not exist in isolation from biology. That is literally why the debate of nature versus nurture exists. And anybody who knows anything about eugenics knows that all the way nature is not the way to go about it. Anybody who tries to ignore the society bit and enforce the biology only bit is inevitably trying to support their own social agenda. And we need to be very, very wary of narratives that come out that way. Examples being eugenics causing racism and genocide or anti-trans bills causing very bad things as well. And at the same time, people will also often come up with all scientific arguments as to why races and transness and queerness and neurodivergency are normal and acceptable and biologically backed up with science as existing, which is kind of what I'm doing here a wee bit, but I find that typically the all biology arguments on the acceptance side tend to be a good deal more holistic than those on the eugenics side. And when they're not holistic, we have a tendency to call them out because they swing all the way in the other direction, which is also not super inclusive. An example of sorts being the autism community combating the idea of autistic people have no empathy with actually autistic people have too much empathy, which still excludes people who have less empathy or medium empathy or anything else in between. But these kinds of biology only narratives aren't just issues on the large scale, like genocide or systemic exclusion from things. They're societal norms, they're patriarchy, and they're pervasive. Because people use these arguments to explain why we don't see as many women scientists, why we don't see as many stay-at-home dads, why trans people are real, etc, etc. And you may be thinking, okay, but that last one is kind of really positive, right? And sure, but even that can have a caveat of sorts, because we shouldn't be basing our own legitimacy on biological determinism. We just deserve to exist because we deserve to exist. And the born this way view of sexuality and gender identity is super great, but it doesn't really acknowledge how much those things change and grow over time as we understand ourselves more and our environments change. And biology only narratives in general kind of freak me out a little bit because of how often they are typically tied to eugenicism. But anyway, let's stop talking about eugenics and let's talk about why the science that you've always heard about very distinct physical and neurological differences between males and females are pretty darn wrong. Also, I have to recommend this book called Brainstorm, The Flaws in the Science of Sex Differences by Rebecca M. Jordan Young. She analyzes nearly every single study that proves the difference between the male and female brain and then absolutely tears them apart to show how they don't stand up to scientific scrutiny. It's wonderful. And you may be thinking, but isn't science supposed to be peer-reviewed to be sure it's not biased and also scientific? To which I respond, my sweet summer child, you can interpret numbers any way your brain so desires and you can set up an experiment in a way that has completely neutral intentions and completely biased results. And since everybody else wants to believe those biased results, your peer reviewers will probably just be like, yeah, that's fine. That's totally fine. That checks out. We read a study in my neuro class this spring that factually seemed to say that your depression would be cured if you were given a new or better immune system because a bad immune system negatively affects your mental health. And when the mice they tested that showed depressive symptoms were supplemented to improve their immune health, their depressive symptoms got better. So the conclusion from that was we should help people get better immune systems with vaccines or whatever so that they won't have bad mental health in their life. Which on the surface kind of checks out, but then when you like really look into the study, you realize that her graphs kind of made no sense and were also really blown up so it looked like it was something. Um, she also only tested like nine mice and also, how do you know that a mouse has depression? Please explain that to me. Also in my eugenics video, we talked about a lot of science um, about specific genetic codes that have been published in journals that are just 
blatantly wrong um, and a lot of racist papers that are also blatantly wrong and also the reason that most of our research into drugs is just kind of like all drugs are horrible and we'll kill you and you need to avoid them all the time rather than research into safe limits of drugs and of preventing and minimizing addiction. Um, so yeah, the funding of research typically goes in the direction that society wants it to go and if papers from that research don't say what those funding it want them to say, they lose funding. And I am, of course, not saying that all science is absolute horse poo because that's not the truth and we're about to talk about a lot of science, but I do want to remind you that if numbers don't quite add up or if you're hearing something that says it's scientific but it doesn't really make sense um, and somebody just keeps telling you, yeah, well, it's science, so it has to be correct, don't just accept that at face value, even if they're a professor. Confirmation bias, which is when you see things because they match up with the belief that you already hold and you want to keep it that way, is a hell of a drug and everything, regardless of how objective it has been marketed to be, which science typically is, on some level there is a human brain with confirmation bias behind it and our brains are not as rock solid as we like to think that they are. But anyway, moving on. So the majority of studies that have proven these differences actually show, quote, too much overlap between sexes and characteristics and too much variation in traits and skills within each sex. So like a study about episodic memory tasks between men and women, which really should have been written as males and females, but whatever, it's 1997 when this was made. Anyway, um, this was used in a class of mine and the table looked like this. Yes, the numbers are technically different. And these graphs, I guess, technically do show a difference between them, but it's so negligible. Like maybe it's significant in the sense of technical statistical st significance it passes that test. But in regards to like life things, the fact that women were likely to remember 0.6 more sentences or 0.29 more faces than men do is completely arbitrary and shows absolutely nothing about anything. I mean, if we got those numbers as a comparison between, I don't know, three-year-olds and high schoolers, we look at them and go, why have they not improved at all? And you will find patterns like this over and over and over again in every single study you read. And it's infuriating because they all cite each other as proof to back up their own things. And then they make all of these claims, like an example from the discussion of this study, which I will link in the description for you. They said, the present study supports previous findings by confirming a higher level of performance for women in face recognition, given name recognition and word recall and recognition, which sure that may be statistically higher, but in reality by one thing, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm getting worked up about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We talked about this for four class periods in the class um, that I studied this in and it was like literally a week after I came out as trans and I was just sitting there like, this is just enforcing gender norms that don't need to happen and also gender doesn't exist and also how could you seriously put this on a slide as a professor and go, yeah, that checks out as a normal and regular thing that I should be teaching to my students. Anyway, this study had a thousand participants and they came out with a negligible result. Why? Because regardless of what group you categorize people into, you're going to have a spectrum of brains and skills, however you categorize. So the next thing that really bugs me to no end about this is that then these studies cite that this shows that men and women have fundamentally different brain structures, which first of all, male and female y'all, gender is not sex. It, no. Um, and I find this a fascinating conclusion because to any person who just kind of exists on the planet, sure, that would be a logical conclusion to come up with. Um, but for a neuroscientist or a psychologist, you know, the ones who are doing this research, they would know that the brain is plastic. It changes all the time. If you play violin, for instance, your motor bit of your brain, the motor cortex, um, is going to have more surface area devoted toward your hands because you need those for that. Same for rock climbers, but they also get more for their feet as well. Professional tennis players have more on the side of their dominant where they hit the tennis from because they use that hand more for tennis. If your native language is sign language, you are going to see the world more spatially because the spatial part of your brain has been used more than a traditional non-signer because your language is spatial. So if we enforce gender roles so much, let's say something random and extreme like women are not allowed to learn a second language, but men can and we enforce that, i.e. every time a woman says she wants to learn French, she is teased and her books are taken away. Uh, meanwhile, her brother has a tutor and has books and speaks French with all of his friends and they always kick the girl out of the room, she can't listen. So if you were to study both of their brains through an MRI, you would go, oh, men have larger areas in their brains devoted to language than women do. And if this was a cultural norm around the world and you measured a thousand people, you would find on average that men had a bit larger language areas in their brains than 
the females did. And if I were a male running the study, which probably you are given the society that I've just, I've just created for you, um, you would conclude from this that men are more capable of learning languages than women are and things should continue as they are in your society because women just don't have the ability or brain capacity without realizing that the reason that they don't have that brain capacity is because they haven't had the chance to do the actual thing to expand that capacity. And you would see some men have more capacity than others. You would see that some women have more capacity than others. The difference is not going to be super major. It all depends on whatever a person's regular capacity is because if you're wondering, no, there is no specific identical structure of a brain. And that's why basic MRI studies um, comparing like autistic brains with other brains, you know, those things are near impossible to understand completely or pick up on scans because you have no clue how the brain looked beforehand or what the basis for it is. But anyway, I digress. When it comes to studies about gender differentiation in brains, it's obviously a bit of a smaller scale than women learning French is illegal. That was a weird example, but yeah, we don't live in a society like that. I hope that that at least helped to clarify my argument for you a bit, because basically a lot of these brain differences, if they exist at all, which we'll get into shortly, are very probably just regular person to person brain differences plus socialization. Because if you're expected to do a lot of a certain task all the time and not much of another task, your brain is going to create the connections between your neurons to be really good at that task that you do all the time because that's efficient and you're not going to have as much brain space devoted to the task that you don't really do because that would be a bad use of brain space. So to sum all of this up in the words of the author of this book, there are methodological weaknesses questionable assumptions, inconsistent definitions, and enormous gaps between ambiguous findings and grand conclusions in those studies. So let's debunk some stuff. By the way, pretty much everything that I'm citing for the rest of the video is from an article that I will link in the description for you. It is called Stop Using Phony Science to Justify Transphobia. It's so beautiful. I'm not going to cite each and every study. They're all in that article. Just check it out. So first of all, let's ignore my dog barking and debunk some basic gender stuff. You know, the whole like, these chromosomes determine your sex thing. So they do, but they're also missing a huge chunk of the story. There's this thing called the SRY gene. And basically there are people who are born with the XY chromosomes whose SRY gene didn't kick in to activate the Y bit of the chromosome. So therefore they were born female despite having XY chromosomes. And it's not like majorly common, but it does exist kind of vaguely commonly. Also, there are people born with just one X chromosome, XXY, XXXXYY, and while these are technically disorders, a lot of people who have them don't display visible symptoms and therefore have absolutely no idea. For example, the majority of the time the XY without the SRY gene is discovered is actually during chromosomal testing for the Olympics of all places. Also, people are born intersex and we don't go testing their chromosomes because genetic testing is expensive and tedious and you learn a lot of things you don't want to know. Also, hormones. Your middle school sex ed teacher probably told you that boys have testosterone and girls have estrogen and progesterone and that's what you just rolled with. Did you know that we all have all of them and also that the levels really aren't majorly super different across the board, differentiated between each sex? Like during infancy and prepubescence, hormone levels for all sexes are precisely in the middle. During puberty, males do have more testosterone, females have more estrogen and progesterone. And then during pregnancy, females have more estrogen. But what I thought was interesting is after puberty, the estrogen and progesterone levels are on average similar between males and non-pregnant females. So measuring hormones, that doesn't really have anything to do with human sex either. So now you know. And on top of that, environmental factors change our hormone levels a lot, more than you might think. Progesterone changes in response to typically male-coded social situations that involve dominance and competition that we would typically make a lot of jokes about how like, oh, the testosterone levels are high in this room. It's progesterone. Um, estrogen also very much has a lot to do with dominance and power social scenarios too. So there's that. Now, when it comes to brains, while well, Sometimes we can see certain brain characteristics that are obviously observably sexually dimorphic. As we talked about earlier, using solely the biological definition for those brain differences is straight up wrong and it hinders a lot of further research. Also, we find that a lot of these specifically male and female things are more 
gray areas than we thought. For example, there's a part of the brain and it's called the sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area, or the SDNPOA. You don't need to remember that, that does not matter. It is slightly larger in males than in females, but what is interesting is that the size in gay males is closer to that of straight females than it is of straight males. And also when you bring trans people into brain studies, which is kind of where science is really pushing right now because they want to answer all of these questions, both before and after transitioning, trans people had values of brain volume and connectivity in between those of typical cisgender males and females. Some other studies showed that for other brain regions, trans people appeared neurologically similar to cis people with the same gender identity and other regions those, well, they were neurologically closer to those with the same assigned sex at birth. So, what did we learn today? Besides the fact that I don't trust scientists, especially men scientists, and also I really hate the existence of gender and gender norms, we learned that your brain is what you make it. Like, sure, you may be worse at something because you were raised with male gender norms, or better at something because you were raised with female gender norms, but that can totally change with some perseverance and determination. And also we learned that we should be thinking critically about all of the science that we consume, and that the definition of human sex is not a one and done thing. You can look at it through a hormonal lens, or a genetic, or a chromosomal lens, or a physical lens, or a neurological lens, or any other lens you so desire, but there is no one consistent definition of sex. So even defining male and female is pretty darn tricky. There are too many individuals to be able to explicitly group with very clear differences between them in the same way that like, if I had a black dog and a white dog sit in front of me, I'd be like, ah, these two are very, very different. But then when I have a room full of like 150 dogs of all shapes, colors, and sizes and whatnot, despite all of them being dog, it's harder to categorize them without significant a lot of overlap because there are so many similarities and differences between groups, which is why maybe we should stop putting people in boxes to try to explain the world despite how emotionally nice it might feel to us in like the two seconds that we've created the categorization um, before we realize that there's so many people that we've alienated by creating said categorization. Anyway, most importantly of all, we have learned that if your psychology professor insists on teaching about gender differences in the brain and that makes you feel really, really weird in your classroom, you can now throw all of these really fun new facts that you learned and you can cite a bunch of really great studies and also a whole book, which is really pretty awesome. Um, it's pretty great of you to, to even do that. I, I think I should make it like a goal of my channel to just slowly infiltrate every psych and neuro department and just change the blatantly ableist, sexist, and eugenicist things that they unknowingly continue to teach to their students, thinking it's still accurate because they haven't done extra research in a long time because teachers don't have free time. That'd be fun. Anyway, as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it is never too late to start over. Please don't be sexist or transphobic. That's just not the vibe. Thanks. Um, and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.